My name is Carol and I'm a medical anthropologist. I was born and raised in the U.S. and I always knew there were worlds beyond what I knew. And I was always curious at other ways of living or being. I, something about the modern world that uh, for myself, uh, I was concerned, I felt like people weren't always connecting with each other. And I saw a lot of sadness, even though there was a lot of wealth surrounding me. And my journey took me to the Himalayas across the world, and I ended up making a life there for 30, 40 years. Um, I was really fascinated. We went up into the high mountains to study polyandry, which is where one woman marries all the brothers in a family. So there'll often be a woman with four or five husbands. So very complex social dynamics. And I was fascinated to understand how they could make something like that work. And as I got to know the women better and their emotional lives better, uh, I felt like anthropology can be a lot of taking. And I was said, well, you know, how can I do anything of benefit? How can I ever thank you for all this time, all these meals you've given me over these, these times, working in the fields with them, spending a lot of time. And they used to say, we need money, you know, we need money. We need to, you know, how, how, how can I educate our, my kids? I want a better life for my children. How, how can I do that? You know, can you help us? We need funding. And that's not easy question of how do you help a woman in a rural part of the Himalayas um, to have a better economic life. It's not such a simple thing. So I was young and naive, but uh, I tried to work on certain income generation practices. And uh, we worked on small projects with women. And out of that, I also then became more close with the women and they would share a lot of their medical um, histories and the challenges of uh, losing many, many children. They have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the world, unfortunately, in this area. A lot of women would die in childbirth. So I became very interested in the herbs uh, that women use traditionally up there, especially obstetric and gynecological herbs and plants. And uh, out of that, I became very interested in how they helped to work with their children and health and in healing. Um, and, but I never forgotten out of that, I actually started to work on income generation using the herbs that come from the high mountain areas. And we made a social enterprise project. So things women could make with their hands, simple soaps and essential oils and things like that. And we made a cooperative of women and still running it today. So uh, before I had my own children, I raised six, my husband and I raised together six foster children and they all in some ways fell into our lap by destiny. They all came from the high mountain areas and um, now we're very happy I'm a grandmother. And then we had two of our own children uh, in Nepal, both home births and uh, two sons. And I used to joke that um, as a I may not be able to accomplish world peace in this life, but if, as a mother, I can raise sons who can love and honor and respect women, maybe that's my own little small contribution to this world. You know, sometimes people will say you have to choose between love or power. Can you love with power and can be power be wielded with love? These are, I don't think, simple questions. Uh, I would say for women that want to yield power, uh, can they recognize uh, love within that? And that sounds very hippy-dippy, uh, but what I really mean by that is a compassion in the truest sense of the word, which is a sense of the interconnectedness of all things and all beings, uh, with a sense of rather than uh, destruction and killing, uh, can we lead from a place that regenerates life in a sustainable way uh, and with a closer relationship to the earth that is our home? In the Mahabharata, 
which is a famous Indian religious text, Arjuna is a great warrior and he wants to see the face of God. He, he asks Krishna to show his face to him before he goes in battle and may die. And Krishna says to him, Arjuna, if I show you all that I am, I could annihilate you. I am more than you can possibly conceive of or possibly hold in one mind. I can only show you a smallest part of who and what I am. And I share that when we think about why do men fear women so much? It's a very deep and a profound question. Some can talk about psychoanalysis and women and mothers and the fear of being enveloped by them. But we women are, many, many will talk of us in stereotypes that we're uh, volatile, that we, have, we contain many within us, that uh, we're ever mercurial, we change and shift. And so we cannot fully be understood only from the rational mind. But I don't think any human being, male or female, can only be understood through the rational mind. There is so much more to being human uh, than what is logical. But we women are very large in what our possibilities are and also in our impact uh, upon our sons and upon our partners. And I believe that in any human relationship, if we can honor or respect a little of the mystery of who that other person is, the other, if there is respect there, uh, the magic or the wonder of who that other person is will always be kept alive, be it in a relationship or be it with a stranger that you meet for the first time. And we as humans often are too lazy to bother to look for that wonder in another person or that mystery or that unknown. And sometimes we're very, very scared or frightened of the fear of the power of the potential which is rests in that unknown. And uh, somehow we women have come to symbolize that for many men. Uh, I think that men who love women who are in power are probably some of the most powerful and strongest men there are. They're probably, in the truest sense of how one might define masculinity, probably the most masculine of men. Uh, in one way, a man who loves woman with lots of power is sort of like a man who works with a wild horse. And uh, if you work with a wild horse, you know that it's not through submission and domination uh, that you can actually train a horse in the best of ways. If you really want a best horse to work with you, you have to work with it. And you gotta work in teamwork together and collaboration. And I think that giving a lot of space you need to give to a big wild horse uh, is a love that understands and supports the mission. You've got to share, actually, have a, a shared vision of what you would hope the world would be and to understand and recognize that the source of that person's power, if the motivation comes from a pure place, and I don't care if you're a man or you're a woman, if your power comes from a place that is oriented from a deeper place that is more about others and not only about yourself and not only about your own gain, be it economic, etc., and with an understanding of what your impact is on, to, the, to the planet itself, uh, maybe we might slowly, slowly be able to change things. And I think that if we can, if a man can love a woman with a power and a woman can exchange and reciprocate that, that example of parenting is something so powerful for any children to see and bear witness to. Uh, perhaps we can make some profound changes in this world. Thank you.